All right. Thanks a bunch. Um, yeah, like I said, like I said, my name is Stephen Atkinson. I'm at GE Research. Uh, this is some work that uh, my uh, teammates Yiming Zhang and Li Ping Wang had uh, helped out with. And um, the topic today is basically an application, is centered around an application in a kind of mi microstructure inverse problems using this technique that we've uh, been uh, using a lot called Bayesian hidden physics models. So um, today's uh, outline of the talk, pretty, uh, pretty typical. I'll just start with an introduction to uh, the sorts of problems that we're looking at doing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Bayesian hidden physics models methodology, uh, the results that we were able to get on uh, this problem and uh, wrap it up with some conclusions. So without further ado, uh, we'll start with uh, the introduction. So the problem setting that, uh, that we're kind of situating ourselves in is, is one of the following. If I've got some data sets that I've gotten, say, from some laboratory experiments, um, I would like to know whether or not I can use some sort of machine learning technique to uh, determine what physics there are that govern the, uh, govern the observables that I just uh, uh, collected information about. And so to be a little bit more precise, precise, I'm going to be talking specifically about a way of uh, approaching this uh, problem that is fundamentally Bayesian, uh, meaning that I am going to talk about what it means in a precise sense to be ignorant about uh, the physics that govern a system, and also to be rigorous about understanding how the data that we have updates that belief and reduces our uncertainty about the physics. And so um, to kind of uh, sum it up the way that we like to say this is that uh, we want to know what the nature of our knowledge is having observed uh, that laboratory data or to put it on, uh, in the other direction. We want to know what are the data telling us about the physics and what aren't they telling us about them? And that's kind of the, um, the driving uh, question that motivated this approach that we'll be looking at. So uh, to take that and make it a little bit more formal, uh, we're going to be looking at problems that can be set up like this. So I've got a system of partial differential equations uh, describing the evolution of some variable u in space and time x and t. Uh, that's going to be described on the right-hand side by some unknown nonlinear partial differential operator that I'm calling f. And so this is going to happen in some spatio-temporal domain where d sub s is my spatial dimension. Uh, I'm going to assume that to close it all up that we've got uh, some initial conditions, or at least that they exist. I'm not going to necessarily say that I know what they are, uh, but to close the differential equations, there are initial conditions, there are boundary conditions. And in order to help us learn about this, we're going to be given some uh, set of data sets that I'm calling D, and it just regards these observables U in the superscript. And what they are basically is I have capital N of them, capital N different uh, distinct experiments, uh, presumably corresponding to different uh, either parametric settings of the above or different particular solutions when you look at different initial boundary conditions. And each data set is just a collection of points in space and time and the corresponding observed uh, values that I'm putting a hat over the U to uh, show you that this is what I have observed, uh, which may be somewhat different from the uh, variables that, uh, that uh, solve the, that the differential equation is posed in terms of. So given all this, we wanna know what F is and uh, not just that, we want to quantify our uncertainty about it, um, which I'm putting this little citation here um, where we first uh, posed this problem and started looking at it in the context of some synthetic problems. All right. Well, um, the application that we're going to be uh, talking about uh, in this talk is this one of non-destructive wave field imaging. So the laboratory setup is something like what you're seeing here. Um, I've got this transducer that I'm putting on a metallic specimen. It's going to impart a um, acoustic wave that's going to uh, vibrate the uh, specimen. 
I've got um, this uh, laser that's uh, uh, pinging the surface from above. And um, so the transducer is going to impart a five megahertz acoustic wave packet. Um, and this uh, laser Doppler vibrometer is going to be measuring the displacement on the surface due to these acoustic waves. And we're going to just simply uh, repeat the impulse that the transducer imparts uh, while we uh, move the laser uh, uh, across a predefined spatial grid. So out of this, we get a spatiotemporal uh, data set of deflections. And to give you some idea of what the resolution that we're working with, uh, we've got five hundredths of a millimeter uh, on this uh, grid spacing in space. And the sampling uh, frequency of the uh, laser is uh, 0.02 microseconds. So the reason why we're doing this uh, laboratory setup is we, I want to motivate this kind of in the context of a little bit of a larger goal in terms of you know, a scientific engineering process where I imagine that we can put together this end-to-end -end AI enabled scientific framework that can take us all the way from the point of view of observations in a laboratory through developing simulation codes, summarizing them as, uh, as needed for, uh, for deployment in uh, applications like uh, sensor, sensing and monitoring. And in the uh, context of this particular presentation, we're just going to be focusing in on this first part, this uh, question of discovering physics from observational data. But we've got the rest of this on our mind. So with that said, I'm going to delve a little bit into the methodology that uh, we're going to be using. Uh, so this slide, we're going to talk a little bit about what is a Bayesian hidden physics model. So uh, this model comprises a few things. The first is a set of leaf nodes that I've shown in this green box. And what these are, are basically neural implicit representations of that spatiotemporal field U of X. And they're going to be parameterized just by simple multilayer perceptrons. In other words, X and T is just a vector that goes into this uh, fully connected neural network and out comes the U, okay? The second component that we're going to have is this root node, uh, which is over on the right here. And what that is, is that's going to be our operator. It's going to be expressed as a function, but this, is, uh, this corresponds to uh, a local operator or a function. So you can see that the arguments to this are going to be, for example, u, the derivative of u with respect to, uh, to x, second derivative, uh, et cetera, something that should be relatively familiar from the sort of pins formalism. So because we're being Bayesian, we're going to pose a distribution over these functions. Um, so one thing that you might uh, imagine using to express that distribution is a Gaussian process, uh, which is actually what we're going to be using in the context of this, though the methodology does admit you know, some general um, distribution over operators. The key is that we want to be Bayesian about it and to be able to update it, our belief on it. So given that model setup, let's talk about how we supervise it or the evidence that we provide to do Bayesian inference. The first part is we are going to use the observations from our data set directly, those U hats, and define a likelihood with respect to the function encoded by the leaf uh, nodes here. So that'll define uh, the first part of our, our model likelihood. And the second part is going to be a likelihood that's associated with the physics, meaning that the prediction that comes out of this root is going to be compared to the time derivative of these uh, fields uh, captured in the leaves uh, shown by this blue partial by partial T block. And all of these are done, are computed using automatic differentiation uh, applied to the MLPs with respect to the inputs as opposed to the parameters. So uh, you put that model all together and you can do Bayesian inference on it. And this essentially constitutes learning the physics this uh, brown box over here. This posterior that you get is in some sense a rigorous uh, quantification of our knowledge and ignorance about the physics that's informed by this data. 
So having written the model, one of the things that I like to do is I like to put one quick remark here, uh, contrasting this machine learning setting, uh, reasoning about uh, these experiments um, in the context of machine learning problems and those that we usually encounter in the context of the physical sciences. So one thing that we like to say often is that physics discovery may very well be a small data problem. And this is in the sense that we may have only a handful of experiments from which we can uh, learn physics. And that'll be the case here. So uh, you might imagine you know, just a handful of experiments right here. Well, because of what we're learning, I contend that this is not exactly correct. Instead, I would say that in some sense, this is really a big data problem in that while we might have three experiments, each of them might generate hundreds of thousands or even up to billions of data points. And so in the context of this input space and the coverage that we get for that unknown operator F, we might actually find ourselves with a lot of data and that's a really good thing. Um, and so that's good news for us, um, but it's not, all, uh, it's not all good news because one thing that we might have to grapple with in practice is that not all of the data are all that informative. In fact, in this case where I'm just kind of showing an example with Berger's equation, a lot of the data end up living in this very small uh, space of the uh, uh, very small part of the input space for that operator F. So there's a lot of redundancy that might tamp down on how much we can actually learn from these data. And again, this really motivates the uh, need to be Bayesian about uh, about this problem, understanding what the data do and don't tell us by way of their coverage. Um, once you've gotten that posterior, um, it's possible to build a simulator around it. It's basically a physics informed neural network where the physics that are informing it are a sample of the posterior from the Gaussian process. Uh, there are technical details um, related to this uh, sampling, which I'm not going to go really into uh, in the context of this talk, but in that uh, paper that I'd shown at the beginning, there's more details. And um, so I'll, I'll just basically leave it at that. Moving on to, uh, to what this all means in the context of the microstructure problem, I want to build a few things into that, uh, into that physics model that aren't necessarily in there for every problem. First of all, I'm going to be working with these uh, data from a polycrystalline metallic specimen. And so I want our physics to be invariant under rotation. And the second thing is that these uh, specimens are going to have uh, flaws or surface breaking cracks in them. So I want to allow for the physics to be spatially heterogeneous in a way that maps to some unknown uh, field parameter. So we write it by decomposing the operator F like this, where on the left, we've got this uh, parameter A, which depends on space, X and Y coordinates, and then this global physics operator F that depends on U, the magnitude of the gradient of U, as well as its Laplacian. Uh, I'll comment in passing here that uh, this reduces to the wave equation in the case that F equals uh, the Laplacian on U. Um, this A is going to be uh, a field that's parameterized again with another uh, MLP. You can think of uh, the sinusoidal representation networks that have become quite popular uh, in the recent past. And I just comment in passing here that this means that if uh, the product of A times F, uh, well, let's first, let's say uh, F is going to be just a Gaussian process distributed. Uh, I'm going to use a linear mean function and then an exponentiated quadratic uh, kernel function. And I'll mention in passing that this means that the product of A times F is also Gaussian process distributed. So that's the method set up. Um, one, last, uh, one last slide here is that I think that it's important to understand um, the, uh, this uh, solution or, or this uh, methodology in the context of uh, other related work. And so uh, one way to think about it is to think about this, uh, a few questions that we can ask about various physics learning approaches. One, whether or not the uh, solution is represented explicitly, think uh, via like an ODE solve or implicitly like we're doing here, whether or not we're looking at ODEs or PDEs, whether or not our representation of the physics is parametric or non-parametric, and uh, whether or not our inference is deterministic or Bayesian. So there are a lot of different uh, works that have been done in this space uh, recently um, that can all kind of be summarized in this little cube here where I have the three different axes 
um, uh, on those uh, three questions that I had asked. And you can see that a lot of the, uh, basically every corner of this has, has been filled at this point by some sort of methodology or another. I think that's important for kind of understanding these approaches in context. That said, let's go uh, and talk about uh, some results. And I'm going to skip this slide uh, and really focus on the ultrasound stuff. So let's look at the specimens first off. On the left, I have a uh, specimen A that we're calling this pristine specimen. Um, here's our description of the space, uh, spatiotemporal domain that we're looking at. And you can kind of see as you look uh, at these snapshots in time, this wave that travels from uh, right to left on it. Um, the second specimen that we'll look at, we'll look at is this uh, so-called cracked one, where you can see that there's some backscattering activity at the center um, that is indicative of a flaw. And then I just mentioned how many data in space and time there are when you uh, take the resolution from the other slide and uh, compare it to uh, these domains. So really there is uh, quite, a, quite a bit of data in spatiotemporal space. Um, so we wanna know if we can learn physics from a single experiment and whether or not it can generalize. Uh, the answer turns out to be yes. So we take this model uh, that we wrote on the other uh, slide we learn uh, jointly using the um, using the, the pristine specimen, a, its solution, its microstructure, as well as this global physics F. And uh, we can see right here that uh, when we compare the observations to uh, what we've got, there's good agreement. And at the bottom here is our estimation of this parameter, which is learned jointly with the physics. And so we see that we think that this um, material is indeed uh, quite homogeneous, which is, uh, which kind of matches our expectations. So given that learned uh, physics F, what we're going to do now is we're going to step over to the second specimen, this cracked specimen, uh, use the same model. And this time we're going to try and learn the solution again, that representation along with a microstructure for this experiment, but we're going to fix the physics and we're going to see whether or not we were able to figure out something that makes sense here. Um, turns out that the answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, so we see good agreement again between our representation, the associated uh, left and right hand sides of the physics as we look in log space on the errors right here. Uh, quite a bit smaller than the magnitude of the uh, signals that we're capturing. And the, perhaps the most surprising part here is that the fact that our microstructure parameter here for this cracked specimen indicates this local, uh, this local deviation from the kind of homo uh, homogeneous uh, rest of the material, which we recognize as being a crack, which is quite exciting to us. So, uh, to wrap it up really uh, uh, quickly, we uh, showed that it's possible to do Bayesian inference to learn physics from data. There's some interesting things that we want to do in the future, kind of uh, thinking more critically about um, what uh, priors we are using, as well as thinking about whether or not we can be more intelligent about the experiments that we're collecting, given that this uh, physics uh, distribution over functions is the thing that we're trying to reduce uncertainty about. So we've got some uh, results that we're pretty excited about there that hopefully we'll be able to share with you soon. Um, but that's it, and I will stop at the, I'll stop right there.